second chapter of Paul's epistle, his letter to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to begin this afternoon at verse number 4. And we will read through verse number 10. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, reading through verse 10. The King James text today reads, But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me this afternoon, let's go to the Lord one more time in prayer. Master, we love you, God. We thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you for the presence of God in this service. Help me, Lord, by your Spirit, by your divine anointing, to deliver the Word of God that you've given me for the church of the living God at this hour. We need instruction of this sort. We need sound teaching in the church today, Lord, for so many have been caused to be distracted by a false message. And yet today, Lord, this is the type of word the church needs to hear. Help me to be effective in delivering this word. Anoint the messenger. Anoint my lips. Help me, O oh God, today, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I've titled my message today, What Role good works. What role has good works? The Apostle Paul makes abundantly clear the role of grace and faith as they relate to salvation in our primary text today. In the next sentence, he almost appears to contradict himself in then going back to the notion of good works. First he tells us, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And yet, he then goes on to say, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works. Well, wait a minute, Paul. You just said that works does not play any role in our salvation. And he continues, which God hath before ordained, meaning established, that we should walk in them. So in one breath he tells us we're saved by grace through faith. And that works plays no role in our salvation. And yet in the next breath he says, But good works are the evidence of said salvation. 
that once you come into relationship with the Lord, once you've been born again, God has ordained that those who have come to know Him, those who have come to become part of His family, those who have been born again, born of water, born of the Spirit, ought to walk afterwards in good works. Oh my goodness. In Matthew 5, 14 through 16, Jesus said, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The Lord says something very interesting because I grew up in church where Everything you did, you know, every good thing you did, boy, you were supposed to practically hide it. You weren't supposed to let people see. You weren't supposed to let people know. Because in some places, the Lord talks about giving and how giving ought to be done in simplicity and how but you know they love preachers and Christians just love to try to make the Bible say more than it says they love to stretch stuff and try to make it cover areas that it is not meant to cover and they love to say, oh, bless God, when you do a good deed, when you do something good, why, you're not going to get a reward from the Lord in heaven if you let other people see. Haven't you heard that kind of foolishness in your life? Oh, you're supposed to do good deeds, but you're supposed to do everything secretively. You're supposed to do everything undercover so that nobody knows. No, 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 no. That is not true. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see what your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Honey, if they don't ever see you do it, they don't ever know you did it. They don't ever knew you did it then they don't have any concept as to your character and your testimony. And I'm just talking plain today. One of the most giving people I've ever had the pleasure of knowing in my life was my grandfather. My grandpa, Bill, my mother's dad, he was one of the most giving people you ever knew in your life. I mean, he would do things for people. He would give people things that he had. And he he did it without a thought, you know. He never now he didn't try to hide doing it. He didn't do it ostentatiously. There's a difference between doing something and having somebody carrying a trumpet and a drum out in front of you while you do it. Right. And there's another thing between simply doing it, but not necessarily trying to hide it from anybody either. You know, you just do it because it's part of your nature. See, when good works, when doing good things is simply part of who you are, then you're going to do them regardless whether anybody's watching or not. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Amen. You're not going to necessarily try to draw unnecessary attention to yourself as you do it, but you're going to do it and people are going to see you do it. Amen. In John chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? He said, I've done a lot of good works. See, the problem we have in the church today is people don't even understand what the term works and what the term good works means. Good works, and I'm going to bear this out in Scripture momentarily. Good works is not living a godly, righteous life. Abstaining from sinful conduct does not qualify as good works. If Jesus had come and lived his life and simply been a godly, righteous man, he'd have gotten very little attention. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. No, what got the attention was 
all the good he did. Amen. Of course, he healed people. He healed the sick. He raised the leper, uh, healed the leper. He raised the dead. He cast out devils. The church is called to do the same thing, but most Christians today don't know the first thing in the world about these things. But we're called to do good works as people of God. There are a lot of Christians that spend all their time trying to live what they consider to be a righteous life. And in the process, they bypass the opportunity thousands of times a week to do good works. And yet, the Word of God said that God ordained that those who have been born again ought to walk in a lifestyle of good works. So, you have to distinguish between righteousness and good works. And there is a difference. Let's continue this afternoon. In Acts chapter 9, verse 36, Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, meaning charity, giving to charity, which she did. This lady had a reputation for being a woman who was constantly doing good work. She was doing good deeds. We all know people who have a reputation for doing good deeds, for doing good things, for helping people. Perhaps they volunteer at a soup kitchen. Perhaps they volunteer at a thrift shop somewhere, a charity shop. Uh, you know, they give to charity. They give to missions. You see them doing good things all the time and they have a reputation for doing good things. Then you have people, and I have to use a member of my own family as an example. I won't tell you who she was. But I have a member of my own family. She's dead now, so. Oh boy, she believed in living righteously. She believed, bless God, you got to follow all the rules. you got to do things God's way or the highway. Hallelujah. It's holiness or hell. Glory to God. But every time an opportunity came her way to do something good, Tommy, she bypassed it. She wasn't interested. She'd come home from work, and literally, I'd hear her, I lived with her for a while, and she'd come home from work and say, Oh, today at work, they were taking a collection for this teacher at school. She's having a baby, and they were taking a collection for her, and they wanted me to give them the collection. I said, Why should I? I don't know her. They were taking a collection for this person at the school who's retiring. Why should I give to them? They don't give to me. Oh, this is a righteous person. This is somebody who's in church every time the doors are open. This is somebody who's shouting dance all over their church building. But every single time, every time, you had an opportunity arise where she could do something good for somebody she wasn't interested. I never saw that woman help anybody in my life. I never saw her reach out to anybody that was suffering or struggling. I never saw her give to anybody that had a need. I never saw her contribute in any kind of... Sometimes there are things you do, and you do them, and the phrase that often is used, you do it out of a sense of goodwill, you know? Why would I contribute to a teacher? I don't know. Because I'm a good person. It's just my nature. You follow what I'm saying? And let me tell you, so if you think people didn't see her selfishness, if you think people didn't see the way she conducted herself, and if you think her lack of good works did not detract from her reputation as a righteous woman. Are you hearing me now? You better think again. So a lot of people looked at her like she was an ungodly, nasty human being. Why? Because she never acted good. She never did any good works. 
opportunity after opportunity was presented to her and that lady would pass it by she was not interested in Romans chapter 11 verses 1 through 4 the word of God reads let every soul be subject unto the higher powers or authorities for there is no power no authority but of God the powers that be are ordained of God Whosoever therefore resisteth the power or the authority, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror, listen, to good works, but to the evil. Who wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. The Apostle Paul here is talking about um, basically law enforcement is what he's talking about, okay? He's talking about law enforcement. He said, listen, law enforcement's not there to punish people for doing good things. Law enforcement's there to punish people for doing evil things. You follow what I'm telling you? I'm here to tell you there is a contrast between uh, righteousness and doing good. There is a contrast between uh, unrighteous and evil. There are many people in this world who live an unrighteous life. They're not trying to do right. They're not trying to live by the rules. They're not trying to follow any kind of a, a moral or, or you know, legal path. Yet at the same time, nor are they trying to be out there murdering and trying to co commit adultery and do things that fall under the category of evil. You know, they're not trying to do anybody dirty either. Do you follow what I'm saying? So what people don't understand is you can be unrighteous without being evil. You can be righteous without being good. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Why? Because you can be unrighteous without doing evil things, and you can be righteous without doing good things. The problem is God has called His people to do good things. In 1 Timothy 6, 17-19, Paul writes to Timothy, Charge them that are rich in this world that they should be not high-minded, nor trust in the uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, or ready to give, willing to communicate. The word communicate literally means to fellowship or interact. I've known some wealthy people in my life. My great-grandmother, bless her soul, she worked as a home health care aide, private home health care aide, for a wealthy family in Connecticut for many, many years. The man in this, there was a Jewish family, and they happened to own a number of different business enterprises. They owned an insurance company, which alone made him a wealthy man. But then he also owned, at the time, a travel agency, and at one time, travel agencies were much more necessary than they are today. And I forget what other business enterprises he owned, but he owned a couple different business enterprises. And they loved my grandmother. She cared for their two. Uh, severely disabled daughters. Both girls were in wheelchairs and they needed somebody to do everything for them. I mean, you know, wash them, feed them, everything. And my grandmother did that for many years for these people. And do you know, every time there was a wedding in our family, Mrs. Sanders would come to the wedding. Every time. She'd be bearing a gift. She'd 
come and here's and she always looked <coughs> this lady I always I used to tell her because I thought the world of her say Mrs. Sanders every time I see you you just look like a million dollars you know she always dressed so nice her hair was coiffed you know and she looked terrific and uh, but here's a woman who's worth so much money <coughs> my grandmother my great grandmother is her servant my grandmother is her employee and yet she thought nothing of mixing with us and mingling with you follow what I'm telling you today now there's a lot of people got enough money they're not I don't know I don't want to be around them people I don't need to be around them people but at the same time, we've all known people who were worth a lot of money, and they didn't have a problem, one, with being around folks who are just plain and simple and poor as anybody could be, am I telling the truth? That's the kind of person God has called us to be. He says, we're not to be the kind of people who don't want to be around others because maybe they don't share our social status or they don't have the same level of income and influence that we have. In the Greek, the word uh, koinonikos is defined as communicate, meaning social or sociable, ready and apt to form and maintain communion and fellowship, inclined to make others share in one's possessions, inclined to impart free and giving, liberal. You know, there's it's one thing for wealthy people to be happy to come down to your level. It's another thing for wealthy people to welcome you up to theirs. Hello now. Well, why don't you come? I'm having a party this weekend. Why don't you come? And they're inviting people at their party who aren't well-to-do, who don't have the same status, who don't make the same kind of money, who don't wear the same kind of clothes they do. But you know what? They're a down-to-earth, decent, good person. And they're willing to share what they have with others. You know, I'm going out on my boat this weekend. You want to go with me? Would, would you enjoy some time out on my boat? Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Tommy and I have never had a problem one with sharing our home with folks, have we, Booby? Mm -hmm. We've had church members. I had church member call us more than once. Say, oh, the air condition went out of the house. And here in Texas, honey, when the air condition goes out, that's a major catastrophe. <laughs> they come, oh, the air condition went out of the house. We can't get a repairman here till two days from now. And what did we do, Tommy? We said, well, why don't you come spend the day, come, come here, spend, uh, you know, spend the, the day and the night at our house. And, and uh, after they get it fixed, then you can go home. But in the meantime, come stay with us. Haven't we done that? Mm -hmm. The Bible said a preacher, a minister of the gospel, a bishop ought to be given to hospitality. And I think in that regard anyway, I certainly fit the bill. I don't have a problem sharing what I have with others. Amen. We've invited people into our home. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I grew up in the Pentecostal movement. I've had pastors that I never one time even so much as saw the interior of their house. And I'm talking about pastors that lived in a church-owned house, that lived in a parsonage. And you know what, Tommy? They never invited me to dinner. They never invited me into their home. They never invited me there to have a meal or even to visit with them. No, it was like their home in a sense. I grew up thinking that the parsonage was off limits to the saints. I really did. I thought it was off limits to us. It was like, no, that's, that's their private place, you know. And we don't have any right to interfere with their private place. And yet all these years that I've been pastoring, going all the way back to the mid-80s, I've never thought anything of inviting members of my church into my home. I've never thought anything. On Thanksgiving, we'd invite them in and we'd have a meal here with them because I didn't want anybody out uh, trying to... Uh, go through the holiday without family and without anybody to connect with. I didn't want people getting depressed and despondent during the holiday season. So we'd invite people into our home, right? Mm -hmm. Then we got into the habit of we'd go to 
first cafeteria over here just down the street from us and we would do Thanksgiving Day and Christmas Day both at first as many people in the churches had nowhere to go or had no family to share the holiday with and if they couldn't afford to pay Tommy and I paid the bill for them but we'd invite them to come and then after that what did we do? Do we kiss everybody and hug their neck and send them home? Oh no! Pastor Charles said no! Come on over to the house! We're going to watch movies! Didn't I? Yeah. We'd sit here and we'd laugh. Oh my goodness, we'd laugh. How many years did we do that? How many people, dozens and dozens and dozens of people, Mary and Penny, I can't even name everybody because I can't hardly, you know, me with names. Can't remember everybody's name. But all the believers we've had come through our house over the years because we're not, we don't have a problem sharing what we have with others. Folks, that is doing good. That is going above and beyond. That is not righteousness. Righteousness is that for which, listen to me, that for which you are personally accountable. You are accountable to God for those things relative to you and you alone. But doing good is what we do above and beyond merely living a righteous life. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the Word of God tells us, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But listen to the next verse. That the man of God may be perfect, meaning complete or mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Well, I'll tell you a little secret. There's going to be a lot of righteous people who miss heaven. <laughs> because it's not works of righteousness which we have done. Isn't that what the Word of God tells us? That brings salvation. It's not works of righteousness which we have done that earns salvation. It's faith through grace by which we're saved. But a person who loves God and has had her come into relationship with God ought to absolutely demonstrate that relationship with God through good works. In Titus 2, 6 and 8, 6 through 8, the Word of God said, Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. What does a pattern of good works mean? It means you do this consistently. You do it over and over again. They didn't say, you know, they don't do something nice every once in a blue moon. No, you see them doing this. Well, every time I turn around, I see Tommy doing this and so. Every time I turn around, the pastor does this and so. Do you follow what I'm saying? I've seen him do it over and over and over again. I told Tommy, I said, you know, Brother Gillum years ago, he was a country boy. Brother Gillum was an old country preacher, I'll tell you. But he wasn't a dumb man. He was pretty smart. He didn't make a whole lot of money at his church, but they provided him a parsonage, so at least he didn't have to pay for housing. Some people say, oh, isn't that wonderful? I'd love to live my life and not have to pay for a house. Yeah, uh, think about this for a minute. When you retire, where are you going to live? So while you want to sit there and judge preachers who live in a parsonage, a house provided by the preacher, think about the fact that that preacher don't own a house of his own. He has no investment in that property. He's not building up equity in that property. Do you hear what I'm telling you now, folks? I'm serious. A lot of people, you know, they love to sit in judgment of preachers. Well, they live in a house provided by the church. They don't have to pay a house payment. They don't have to pay rent. <laughs> Yeah, but they sure enough have to do something to provide for themselves in old age. Because I got news for you, honey. Most churches don't have any kind of retirement plan. 
That preacher got to do what he can for himself. Well, what Brother Gillum did over the years was he somehow or another scraped up enough change. He was able to establish good enough credit so that he could go buy himself an investment house that he could rent out to folks, you know. And then after a while, he was able to get another one. After a while, he was able to get another one over the years. You know, not mansions. I'm not talking about he didn't rent out, you know, big gorgeous beautiful properties but I mean nice little houses and he kept them up well he was not a slumlord and you know what brother Gillum it was known everybody knew that there were times when there'd be a fire in the community and a family be burned out of their home and brother Gillum happened to have his rental house empty and, and the people, last people who lived there had moved out and he hadn't rented it yet and he called up the Red Cross, and he'd say, listen, if you send that family over over here, he said, I've got a three-bedroom house they can live in. He said, I can let them have it for nothing for six months. And he did that over and over again. Every year when high school kids uh, from the church graduated high school, when kids would graduate high school, Brother Gillum used to have a little annual get together that he engaged in and he would take uh, the people from the church who had graduated that year and he would take them all out to dinner and he'd buy them all dinner and I, I have no idea where all this background noise is suddenly come from let me try it this way and see I have an idea of the batteries dying on that mic so he would take these people out for dinner and he'd pay for them I remember going one time to a yard sale that the church was conducting and I was living, I was 16 years old, I was living on my own. I'm going to tell you, I was living as poor as a church mouse. I didn't have money for nothing. I barely had money to eat. I didn't know what it was to go to a store and buy a new shirt or buy a new pair of pants. Forget about it. I wore what I had, and I had what I wore. I still have a habit of holding on to my clothes till they're so old, you know. I've got stuff in my closet now I've owned for literally 30 years or better. But I went to this church yard sale that they were having, and Brother Gillum come over to me and he said, Chuck, he said, why don't you look at the suits and stuff over there? Uh, and, and they had a lot of stuff that, for the Riverside yard sale, you know, and uh, a lot of clothes, a lot of stuff. He said, why don't you go look at you some suits and jackets and stuff. He said, I know you like to dress nice for church and everything. He said, why don't you go over there and take a look and see if there's any ties or shirts or suits, whatever you need. He said, you just pick it out. He said, then when you're done, he said, bring it over to the ladies who are taking the money and you tell them, he said, I'm going to let them know. He said, but you tell them that Brother Gillum said that you could have those things. Well, of course, you know, the way I was raised, we didn't take advantage of people. I've had people that I've offered to buy a meal for, and they literally would order the most pricey thing on the menu, you know, and, and go out of their way to make it as high as they could. Had one guy in the church used to do it and brag and tease about it. Well, since you're paying the check, well, since you're paying the check, now, I think that's ignorant, but that's beside the point. I don't do that. So I looked and I found a few things, you know, and I thought, well, this little suit would be nice to have a suit, a matching suit, you know, and what have you. So I went over to the ladies and sister uh, so-and-so to say, well, yeah, Brother Gillum told us, so you're fine, Chet, you're good. A few minutes later, I see Brother Gillum over there standing there. And he's got his wallet out and he's peeling out money and he's handing it to these ladies. He didn't just let me have it. He paid for it. You follow what I'm talking about? There's a pattern of good works. If you watch that man's life, there was a pattern of good works. It was obvious that he was always doing good things for people and helping people. Do you follow what I'm saying now? That's how believers are called to conduct themselves. Paul, uh, 
in Titus 2, 6 8, it continues, Let men, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. In Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as ye see the day approaching. You see, there's a reason we go to church. There's a reason why we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Sometimes we get so caught up in ourselves, we get so caught up in our own lives, we get so caught up in our own troubles and in our own worries that we might just fall out of the habit of doing good things like we ought. And you know, when we come together as believers, you know what part of the responsibility of the church is? Part of the responsibility of the church is to provoke one another, meaning to encourage one another to do what? A, to love, and B, to good works. I've used the example before, I'm going to use it again. Tommy and I, over the years, he'll work with somebody has a job and they'll say well this lady's husband is in the hospital he's got to have heart surgery or whatever the case might be and I'd say to him well are you going to go visit him well Tommy didn't grow up the way I grew up he looked at me and said why in the world am I going to do that because it's above and beyond it's not about righteousness it's about doing good do you follow what I'm saying you do good. You're there to encourage. You're there to be a blessing to Him. Part of the Christian life is trying to be an encouragement and a blessing to others when we have opportunity. Or He'd say, well, somebody at my job, you know, her father died or so-and-so died. And He'll tell you, I've gone to funerals of His co-workers family members that died with him. I've gotten him to go with me, I might ought to say. Why do I do that? Because as a child of God, I'm supposed to show a pattern of good works. Do I think twice about doing those things? No, to be honest with you. The minute I hear an opportunity to do good somewhere, immediately my first thought is, oh, well, let, let's do that. Not everybody thinks like me. So sometimes you're in church and you say, well, you know, my co-worker just lost her husband uh, the other day and the funeral's going to be Monday. And the other person in the church will say to you, oh, are you going to go to the funeral? Do you follow what I'm saying? You see, they're, they're provoking you. They're encouraging you to do good works. They're encouraging you to do good things. Well, you know, my husband's great aunt was just put in a nursing home the other day because she has a hard time caring for herself at the house. Oh, are you going to go see her? Do you follow what I'm saying? These are thoughts you might not have had. These are ideas you might not have had. But other believers in the church who are thinking and who are uh, looking at things maybe a little bit differently than you are, they're able to provoke you unto good works. They're able to encourage you and inspire you to do some good things. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? We ought to encourage one another. We ought to provoke one another unto good works. Doing righteousness, doing that which is expected of us, is not doing good works. There are a lot of people, who are Christians, who read their Bible and they read the words good works and, and works and they think to themselves, oh, well, am I living righteous? You know, am I trying to be the most righteous and godly person that, can, that I can be? That's what it's talking about. No, it ain't. You couldn't be more wrong. Doing more than what is expected of us 
is counted as good works. Good works are the evidence of a walk with God. Our testimony must not consist alone of simply not doing evil, living right or living righteously, but also of expressly doing the polar opposite and actively doing good. You following me? In Matthew 25, 31 through 40, now you're going to understand why I'm saying this today. The Lord Jesus said, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Listen. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Notice he starts out saying, the people he's talking to have already inherited the kingdom. They don't get the kingdom because they did these things. That's the first point you need to get. He said, no, he said, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom that's been prepared for you. So these are people who already have been born again. These are people who are already heaven bound and ready. But then he turns around and says, you've done all these things for me. And who answers them is his, the righteous answer. Because who should be doing these things? The righteous should be doing these things. It's not that these things are a demonstration of righteousness, but it's that a righteous person knows to do good works. The Lord said, all these things, you fed the poor, you visited those who were sick. You wonder why when Tommy says to me, oh, so-and-so, her husband's in the hospital, and I say, are you going to go visit him? Why do I say that? What did Jesus say? I was, in, I was sick, and you visited me, right? Oh, so-and-so's in jail. How many times have I had to go over the years to visit somebody who was in jail? I've had to do it. Not so much here in Dallas uh, as of late, but over the years I've had to do it. Had to go see people in jail. Had to go to hospitals at 4 o'clock in the morning because somebody's loved one was in a car wreck and the family was distraught. And there was no way in the world I was going to let them sit there in that hospital without some emotional support outside of their own family. Of course, I'm a pastor, so I mean, you know, I have that pastor's heart. I want to do things to encourage and to support and to comfort God's people. But every believer ought to think that way. I'm going to tell you, there is nothing more wonderful than when the church comes together around one of its own when a tragedy strikes or something terrible happens. There is nothing more wonderful than 
to see a church gather. You know, how many of us come from that tradition where after a funeral, the church ladies have gotten together and thrown out a big spread of food and all that to accommodate all the people who came to the funeral. And that saves the family having to mess up their house and having to try to entertain people when they're in no mood to be entertaining people or trying to cook when they're in no mood to be trying to cook. You know what I'm saying? Isn't it a wonderful thing to see? Don't you appreciate when you see God's people acting that way? In Luke chapter 6, my last passage for the day, in Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38, But I say unto you which hear, Jesus is speaking, love your enemies. Listen. Do good to them which hate you. Mm. Mm. Boy, I could go off on a tangent right about now, couldn't I? We could talk about baking cakes for queer weddings, couldn't we? We could talk about issuing wedding licenses to people that we don't believe ought to be able to get married. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid him not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Listen. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful, and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. What role has good works? Good works won't get you into heaven. You can do all the good in the world and you're not going to get into heaven on the strength of good works. The only thing that will get you into heaven, the only thing that's going to help you see Jesus one day, is faith and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. But, if you think once you've come to God, the only obligation you have is to live a good, clean, so-called Christian righteous life, then you haven't read your Bible very well. You've missed an awful lot. Because God's people are called to good works. They're called to go above and beyond and they're not called to go above and beyond for just their own crowd. They're not called to go above and beyond for just their own family. They're not called to go just and beyond for just their own church folks or just their own denomination. No, we're called to go above and beyond even for people we can't stand. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to tell you, and I'm trying to close, i got a neighbor I'm not all crazy about. This, this one neighbor we've got here, I'd be happy to move away from him, to be honest with you. I've never lived beside somebody so contrary and so negative and so 
fault finding and gripey and grumpy in my life as this lady. Her husband and I have always got along very well, but she is just the most miserable human being that I've ever wanted to deal with in my life. Every single time, if I was out on my mower and I was mowing the grass and I saw her walking in my direction, I knew that I knew that I knew she's going to have some gripe about something. And she did. She never failed me. Never one time. Finally, one day, I, I, I literally called her out on I said, you know what? I knew the minute I saw you walking in my direction, I knew you're going to have something to gripe about. And by God, you didn't disappoint me. I can't stand people like that. That drives me up the wall. But I can tell you with all honesty, if something happened to those folks and they were in, you know, something terrible were to happen, a fire or a break-in or anything like that, I would be every bit as quick to try to defend them or I'd be every bit as quick to try to help them. I'd be every bit as quick to invite them into my home and try to comfort them and feed them and do what I could for them as I would anybody else. And that's the truth, and God knows it's the truth, because that's just how I am. I have a family member who over the years treated me very, very poorly. I mean badly. As a matter of fact, I think I could probably go so far as to say terribly. And when I moved from back up home to New England from Texas as a kid this family member was here in Texas and when I moved back up home and everything and this family member would come up home every summer she'd come up home to spend a couple months and visit she did it every year I'd go over to my grandma Bell's house my mother's mother's house I'd go over there so I could visit with her and my grandmother said to me CJ stands for Chuck Jr. she said CJ why in the world, after everything she did to you, how in the world can you continue to be so good to her and so kind? And you said, you just act like nothing ever happened. That lady let you go hungry, and she knew you were hungry. She let you suffer when she could have easily, easily helped this is the same person I told you about a while ago who never helped nobody no kind of way, who never contributed to any kind of retirement, you know, collections or baby, new baby collections or what have you. Same person. My grandmother said, you know, said, how in the world? I said, Grandma, because that's what God's called me to do. I'm not called to hold a grudge. I'm not called to run around, you know, staying angry at people. I said, She'll answer for that one day. The Lord's going to hold her accountable. I tried to go to her and settle the issue myself. I tried to talk to her about it myself, but all she ever did was turn around and make herself out to be the victim, like I was attacking her. I said, okay, well, the Bible said if somebody's wronged you, you're supposed to go to them and talk to them. I said, well, I tried. She didn't want to settle the debt on earth, so guess what? It's not settled in heaven. She'll answer to God for it one day in the judgment. If she had just talked to me and apologized, then I could have forgiven and forgotten, and the matter would have been settled on earth as it is in heaven, but we were never able to get there. So she'll answer one day. I said, Grandma, you know... I, I can't just love people that have loved me and love people who have done me right. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? I have an aunt, a sister, my mother's sister. My whole life, that girl, first of all, I think she got a demon, and I'm not joking. She's the most judgmental, critical, nasty human being that God ever made. Has been since the minute she was born. She's not very much older than me, and I think that my being the first grandchild kind of created a problem for her. You know, she was just a kid, and I was the first grandchild, and I think there was a little bit of, of uh, jealousy or, you know, what have you, uh, over me stealing away some of the attention, you know. 
But that girl, my entire life, oh goodness, I could tell you story after story after story of incidents where this girl just did nothing but torment me like you wouldn't believe. When I came out in 1989, oh, this woman tormented me. She'd preach at me and holler at me, and she had more to say than anybody had to say about it. Judgment, criticism, you just all kinds of garbage coming off of her lips. Well, I lived in New York City. I had a number of family members who, uh, in my family, New York scares folks to death. You know, it's such a big city and everything. And I had a number of family members who, because I lived there and they knew me and they trusted me to be a tour guide and what have you, they asked me, you know, would, would you mind if we came to New York, you know? And I said, oh, I'd love for you to come. I'd love for you to come on. And I had aunts and uncles and cousins and all this come at different times, you know, and I'd take them around the city and I'd give them the grand tour. And I mean, we'd see everything. And if they were interested in seeing specific sites or specific, I'd make arrangements to go to those specific places and show it to them, you know. And I love doing this with people. And one day this aunt, who's been nothing but miserable to me every day of my life, asked me, if I were to bring my kids out there, would you mind taking us around? I said, well, of course. Yeah, sure I would. I'd be happy to do it. See, doesn't the Bible tell us not to return evil with evil, but to return evil with good? Isn't that what the Scripture says? I didn't... All I know is my Bible teaches me that I'm, a, I'm supposed to have a pattern of good works. If I'm living this thing, it goes beyond my living righteously. It goes beyond that. It goes to my going above and beyond and doing good besides living righteously. So she came with her kids and I showed them the tour, the same tour I gave anybody else I showed them took them all over. We had a nice time. Later, one of her daughters and a friend of her daughters come out to the city and spent a couple days with me by themselves. And I took them around and we did a whole bunch of stuff. You know, folks, I'm trying to tell you today, good works won't save you. But good works are necessary. God's looking for us to demonstrate a pattern of good works. Do we see the opportunity to do good? as a child of God, and do we seize upon those opportunities? While good works are not the means of attaining salvation, they're most certainly the mark of those who have been saved. We've been called to righteousness, but living right and doing right is what is expected of us. Doing good Going above and beyond merely living a righteous life is how we demonstrate our relationship with the Lord. And actually, I missed this passage earlier. I'm going to throw it at you real quick. Luke 17, 7 through 10. I don't know how I, I went over this in my notes. Jesus said, But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, Go and sit down to me, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. In other words, the Lord says, you've got a servant. The servant's out in the field working. He comes in from the field. He said, are you going to tell the servant, oh, you go eat now? No. He said, most of the time, the master's going to say, okay, now you're back in the house. Now i got to eat. It's time for you to make dinner and serve it to me. Listen to what the Lord continues to say. He said, doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, 
we are unprofitable servants, for we have done that which was our duty to do. So righteousness is what's our duty to do. Good works is above and beyond righteousness. Going the extra mile, so to speak. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon?